Manhattan Neighborhood Network, in partnership with the League of Women Voters of New York, the Amsterdam News and Gotham Gazette is pleased to bring you a debate among the Democratic candidates running for City Council in District 8. Hi, I'm Diane Collier, and I am a longtime resident and serve as the chair of Manhattan Community Board 11 in East Harlem. The New York City primaries will be held on Tuesday, September 12th for offices from mayor through the city council. The winners of these primaries, like this one in Council District 8, will be the Democratic nominees in November's general election. District 8 covers the East Harlem, El Barrio, Randall's Island, Ward's Island in Manhattan and parts of the Bronx. City Council Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito currently represents the district but is not eligible to run again because of term limits. We've invited all of the Democratic candidates who are able to join us here today to keep their responses to one minute and any rebuttals they may have to 30 seconds. The candidates are seated in random drawings starting from my left. We have Diana Ayala, Robert Rodriguez, and Tamika Mack. Welcome candidates and thank you for being here. My first question, goes to Ms. Mapp. Ms. Mapp, why are you running for this office and what are your specific qualifications to represent and serve this community? Um, I'm running for this office because our community needs a change. And what makes me qualify for this office is my 20 years of public service, um, numerous um, community activate, activate, activism from minimum wage to family law reform to um, senior support to being a PTA president of the school, being um, a school leadership team support member. So that's what makes me qualified to run the seat. Robert Rodriguez, the same question. Sure. As someone born and raised in East Harlem uh, and has spent the last 15 years serving in the community, first as a community board member, then eventually as community board chair as a volunteer, and then having had the opportunity to represent the uh, East Harlem part of the district for the last six years, We've been making that uh, effort to fight for affordable housing and make sure that we meet the needs of the residents and get the Second Avenue subway to come up to 125th Street and get funding for NYCHA. And I'm proud to have had the opportunity to represent uh, uh, us in the assembly, but now this is a unique opportunity to bring that experience to the city level uh, with the opportunity to represent uh, this district and the city council. And I think having that experience and having won those battles in Albany and being able to bring the benefit of that experience to bear uh, in this open seat for the city council can make a difference on what our future is going to look like over the next five to ten years. And I think I'm uniquely experienced to be able to make the changes that we need and uh, 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 pa uh, make forward a, a path to um, uh, affordability and, and sustainability for all the residents of the district. Diana Ayala, the same question. Uh, I've been in this community for over 20 years, serving both the East Harlem and South Bronx parts of the district. Uh, first as a caseworker at Corsi uh, Senior Center. I've worked at the Carver Houses uh, Senior Center as a program director and spent the last 11 years working for the New York City Council Speaker, which has afforded me an opportunity to work both in East Harlem and the South Bronx, working with resident leaders, working with our local senior centers, working with uh, <clears throat> tenant uh, community activists, and a lot of community-based organizations. I have a, well, a very good understanding of the district, of the needs in the district, and have been working it uh, very aggressively bringing in um, money for playground renovations, for security enhancements, uh, new features in the senior in the local senior centers, expanding uh, services in our after-school programs, and I feel that. Um, my personal experiences also have weighed in on why my decision to run. I'm a person who has been a survivor of domestic violence. I have been in shelter. I have been hungry. And I think that, you know, it gives me a, a different perspective on how we do uh, policy in city government. What do you consider the most pressing needs of the district? And what would be your first order of business when elected? Robert, we'll start with you on that question. I think affordable housing is, without a doubt, the most pressing need, and it has to be a threefold effort. One is preserving everything that we have, specifically New York City public housing and our Mitchell-Lama housings, both of which I've worked actively on while in the assembly. Before I got to the, to the state and represented us, the state gave no money for public housing. Today, we can say that there's 300 million uh, slated from the state to go into public housing, and that's important for the future of NYCHA. Mitchell Lamas, you know, we 
have fought to make sure that developments like Lakeview and Franklin Plaza and 1199 have resources so that they can stay the backbone of working class housing in our community. And then thirdly, any new affordable housing, you know, we worked very hard to make sure that there were affordable housing guidelines on our community board to define affordability levels and uh, make sure that developments that come in actually meet those levels. And that's for everybody. Those people who make as little as $15,000 who are on Social Security up to as much as uh, you know, eighty dollars to $100,000 for working families. That has to be our mantra moving forward if we're going to really address the crisis that we have in our community. Diana. I agree with the assembly member. Housing is, uh, is, is, is number one on the, the list of priorities. Uh, preservation of units, existing units, is very important to me. Uh, bringing in more resources to public housing is also really important because we want to be able to not only preserve that vital uh, housing stock, but also enhance the quality of life of the residents that live there now. Um, we've put in a lot of measures through the city council to protect tenants' rights. I think that we could, there's always room you know, for more. Um, public safety is also an issue that I'm, you know, very, uh, I feel very, really strongly about as a person who has been personally affected by gun violence and a, and a resident and a constituent in this district where we continue to see, you know, um, gun violence happening um, day in and day out. Um, that's something that I would like to uh, pay a little bit more closer attention to. Tamika? Um, affordable housing, um, making sure that NYCHA and NYCHA is accountable for all the repairs that need to be done inside of all NYCHA development, making sure HPD is held accountable to do their repairs on their end, making sure that we, when we do luxury housing is for everybody and have a mixed income development for every income bracket to stay in there, regardless if you make $500 a month if to up to $3,000 a month, I feel that you need to be able to live together. And actually working with the, the Department of Superintendent, working with my parent coordinators and working with my principals inside the schools and trying to get the funding they need, make sure they have a working smart board, making sure they have gym classes, make sure they have an actual library to actually go to and do the research that they need. So that's the issues I'll be working on when I get elected. Thank you. The next question is, constituent services are a main function of each council member. What services do you envision to be the most needed, and what will you do to effectively provide such service? And we'll start with Diana. Well, I was the director of constituent services for the New York City Council Speaker for seven years uh, before becoming deputy chief of staff, and I take that I took that responsibility very seriously because the bulk of the issues that come, the way that we legislate is really based on the, the issues that are coming to the office. Um, for instance, we, did, we, we put in tenant protection um, bills. We introduced tenant protection bills based on the information that we were receiving from residents that live in East Harlem that were illegally being pushed out. Um, I, I, I think that we've done, we've done an outstanding job. We've also been able, through that process, through that, through that unit, to bring in free legal services for NYCHA residents, free legal uh, services for undocumented uh, residents. Um, we've been able to bring in CCRB uh, cl uh, clinics also to the district via the constituent services unit. So it's, I think it's, it's something that's really important. Tamika. Um, I kind of laugh at myself and say that I'm going to have the most committees out of everybody because I truly believe it takes a community to run a commu community. So I'll be holding monthly um, committee meetings for all constituents so they can come to the office and actually decide what we need to be done so I can take it back to my colleagues and press their issues that's most important to them. So I'm going to have a youth committee, I'm going to have a senior committee, an LGBT community. Um, a small business committee as well so they can know what resources out there to get their businesses up and running. So I'm all about community and I don't want somebody just when they have a problem come into the office. I want them to be proactive and making sure that the office is welcome and they can come in at any given time and get the voice to be heard. And Robert. Sure, as, as assembly member, um, we, that's, our, that's the main part of our function and our responsibility is to make sure that our doors are open and that we're addressing the needs of our constituents on a daily basis. And there's no question that the number one um, constituent complaint or, or need continues to be around housing, keeping people who are able, uh, who are in their apartments to stay in their apartments, which means that we've dealt with countless number of um, uh, um, issues around 
uh, repairs for NYCHA, eviction prevention services, uh, making sure that we're providing um, access uh, to, to folks who are uh, looking for new apartments or, or housing within the district, um, but also making sure that we are addressing the variety of needs and services that people have. We also have um, significant issues around uh, Medicaid access and people understanding what they can and, and can't get, particularly a lot of concern around what's happening in the discussions on federal levels about Medicaid and potential cuts there and what's going to happen to uh, our community if that happens in institutions like Metropolitan Hospital and Lincoln Hospital. So I think those are just a few of the issues we're going to continue continue to make sure that we provide stellar services much like we have in the assembly uh, and, and hopefully bring forward that mantra into the city council. So let's turn our attention to a subject that you did bring up, tenant harassment. Uh, how do you plan to protect tenants from being ousted from their homes uh, by extreme and sometimes aggressive measures by landlords? And let's start with you, Tamika. Well, I'm going to help them get the legal services that they need. And if I need to go to court with them and be by their side, I will do that. So that's what I'll be doing. Diana? So I think that we've done really well in terms of, you know, putting in uh, laws that protect uh, tenants, uh, not, you know, citywide. And so the Tenant Protection Act allows residents to sue their landlords for harassment. And harassment is defined a little bit more broadly because of that, that, that bill. Um, we also, again, have legal, free legal services in the district office, but we've also, the city council has also funded uh, free legal services in the district through the tenant uh, protection unit um, to help residents that may be being displaced because of gentrification. I think that we've also held a numerous amount of workshops on tenants know your rights. We organize a whole a bunch of buildings, which is really important because getting the word out has been really challenging. How do we, we have all of these laws that protect residents, but not every resident is as informed as they, they should be or could be um, about, you know, the laws that protect them. And so uh, getting the word out has been, you know, pretty challenging. We've, we've worked really aggressively again through the workshops to try to get the information out out. Um, but I think that we've done we've done well. There's always more to do. Robert. Sure. Along those lines, as, as was mentioned, and, and it can't be uh, reiterated enough, the work is never done. Whether we talk about New York State and the Tenant Protection Unit and, and, and the support that comes there, having created that three years ago was important. But we are continuing to hear complaints about uh, people feeling pushed out by their landlords because of the aggressive rise in rents that have happened there. And many of them are either um, uh, have language barriers or, 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 or have documentation status and as a result stay silent as these things continue to happen. Um, so uh, the, of course right to counsel is a very important part that was recently passed by the city council which should help to address this but there's no question that there needs to be more um, enforcement of these activities both you know in the city level and on the state level when you when you report these things they're not often addressed immediately and by that point you know you've already uh, felt a significant amount of, of harassment and are trying to figure out what to do next so I think making sure that we continue to put resources towards enforcement and making sure that we do the outreach and, and support folks who are experiencing that is continues to be important. So you've all mentioned NYCHA, and as we all know, East Harlem is, has the second largest percentage of NYCHA housing in a district. So I'm going to turn our attention to the question concerning it. We all know about the disrepair and all of the issues that our NYCHA residents are experiencing. So how would you propose to improve the quality of life for those living in our public housing in East Harlem? And let's start with Diana. I think that we've done some of that um, by investing capital dollars for uh, repairs and security measures to the environment. Um, while people are really appreciative of that, I don't think that it really touches on the personal aspect of as a resident of living in public housing with mold issues, um, you know, uh, slow t um, timeliness of repairs. And so we've done a lot of work. Obviously, we've, you know, we have uh, worked very closely with the Community Voices Heard, which is a community-based organization that has been lobbying con uh, Congress uh, you know, to push for further funding on the federal level. We've also been pushing, you know, very aggressively for the state to put in the funds that they hadn't put in since the late 1990s. Um, and, you know, we're going to start having some serious discussions about how do we, uh, how do we bring in more revenue uh, to protect this vital housing stock and to, you know, bring it up to code. Robert. I think everything has to be uh, on the table to address this. And 
all levels of government have to be participating. We, I mentioned earlier the state participation, that needs to increase, and, and that's something that I think um, would, uh, I can be helpful in terms of leading those efforts, whether at the city council or in any other capacity, but hopefully there, because we know that there's more that, that, that can be done. There's also additional funding sources that have not been, been revisited. We've talked about Battery Park City as a potential area to get millions of dollars into New York City public housing, because we know that the $17 billion of need means that our roofs don't get repaired, elevators don't work, mold doesn't get remediated, our playgrounds don't get fixed, we have lesser security cameras, so I think everyone has to come to the table to really address um, a, a solution for the 400,000 residents who live in public housing and deserve better. So I think you know, being able to bridge that gap, understanding the city has made a contribution that's not enough, the state needs to make more of a contribution, but together that, uh, only together can we solve that problem. Tamika. I'm going to just go to um, the Department of Housing at the city council level and asking on him why there's no bills that have been helping NYCHA residents and trying to get the ball rolling. And if that means that I have to sue NYCHA to make sure they get the repairs that they need, that's the job I'm going to be taking to do that because no one should be able to live without um, cooking their food within five months without show, getting an apartment shown to them and then it's nasty and in disrepair and if they don't take it now they go all the way back to the bottom of the list. That needs to stop and the only way we can stop that is by making sure that the housing committee is pretty much accountable for their actions. They've been going so long of unchecked and no one's been checking these um, housing authorities so it's my job when I get in there to actually check them to make sure things is getting cleaned up. So you know that the administration, Bill de Blasio's administration, and the previous one, is looking at private and public partnerships as it relates to solving the NYCHA problems. So where do you stand on this issue, particularly as it relates to infill? I mean, we've had, we've had some infill projects in the district already. We've seen at Millbrook Houses, we have a 100% affordable senior development, which has been very, you know, really well received by the constituents in that, in that part of the district. Obviously, we are in need of housing, right? So that's, that's one of the issues that infill kind of helps to alleviate, right? It's how do we bring in, we lose almost 400 units of housing a year to destabilization, so we need to build, right? We have an opportunity to kind of do that in public housing. I don't think that is the idea that, you know, we're all really excited about, but I think the, the reality that we're facing now is that we want to, the, the goal here is to preserve, to save, you know, public housing um, and to keep it intact. We, you know, they serve, uh, the, the, the neediest, you know, individuals, people with the lowest income brackets, you know, depend on these apartments. And so how do we preserve it? So infill might be a conversation that we want to have. I would love to be able to see, I would love to see that it's beneficial that we're bringing in the necessary resources. I, I think it's a, you know, vital um, public land. And if we're going to sacrifice it, if you will, then it has to be, it can't be at the expense of the residents that live there. I think that they need to lead that conversation. And I also feel that, you know, there has to be some evidence-based, you know, data that's, that, that reflects that the revenue is worth the investment. Tamika. Um, I don't believe in infill because when you do infill, you're taking away my parking spaces for the residents that's there. You're taking away parks for my children. So um, there's a lot of housing that the city can preserve. They just, just wear and housing it. So they need to look at the existing housing that they have and fix that up and making sure it's access and available before they start taking away parking lots and public parks away from our children. So I'm totally against infill. And Robert. I think all solutions have to be on the table, both for dealing with the housing crisis, but also addressing the NYCHA funding uh, crisis. And I think, um, you know, infill has to be considered, but there has to be a significant benefit for the community. We've seen it, as was mentioned in Millbrook, but we've seen an, uh, a different scenario when we look at homes, which is currently in the assembly district, where I don't think there is enough benefit. Uh, I think what has been proposed is, you know, 50% market rate and 50% affordable, and then uh, a one-time um, uh, fee of $25 million dollars that would go towards NYCHA and it's not even clear how much of that would go towards dealing with improvements in that particular development. So I think there um, you know, is, has to be a significant benefit for the residents of the community. It has to address some of the repair issues and the capital issues in that development and it has to be clear what's happening. And I think one of the issues around infill is there has to be a community benefit agreement tied to these potential developments that 
clearly identify what are the residents getting out of these um, these deals and how is it helping their quality of life in their developments since they're the ones that are being asked to sacrifice so much. So NYCHA has served as a means of affordability for many, many citizens in, in New York City. Now let's turn our attention to affordability. Affordability housing is very rare and it's shrinking. Is New York City's affordable housing plan working, in your opinion? And let's start with you, Robert. I think more needs to be done. I think 200,000 units, while is a great goal, is not enough to meet what we know is a significant um, demand. I mean, just on New York City public housing, we have a wait list of almost 200,000 people looking for, uh, for housing there, and that's not counting the tens of thousands of applications that we get for every single development that we look to bring online. So I think we have to work aggressively at um, preserving uh, and giving people an opportunity to stay in their homes, but also think about how we look at um, increasing the number of units that, that we bring online. And I think that's an important conversation um, in terms of dealing with the, those demand issues and then the affordability question, making sure that that's available to the residents who live there as well as those who, are, uh, who represent working families. Tamika. Um, no, it's, it's not enough um, because right now when a new development comes in play, they want you to make between $30,000 to $33,000 and as you know, half of the district doesn't even make that. So it, my job when I become city council member is trying to reevaluate the numbers and making sure that people that makes $1,000 a month or $12,000 a year or $22,000 a year and $19,000 a year would be able to qualify for that housing and restructuring our lottery system because you know your name you go to this lottery system you get a little card back and then you don't know where you at and then you know as life goes on you kind of like okay I didn't get qualified but you don't really have time to follow up but you're never going to get into that development with a, a flaw lottery system like that so it's going to be my job to re, re assist a new lottery system so when you actually get a lottery back you know where you stand at all times so you can be look, looking like, okay, I'm that much closer to what I want to be. And Diana? I think that is a start. I think that it's afforded people, a lot of people in this city, an opportunity to get, you know, um, access to affordable, decent, you know, housing units. I think that uh, having been the, cons the director of constituent services for a long time, you know, the information that I was receiving from the constituents is that there is a, a huge demand for these apartments. Um, I don't think that they do enough for the people on the lower income bracket, but I do believe in mixed housing and I see the need um, based again on my conversations with constituents that would otherwise qualify, but the impediment has been mostly primarily based around in um, credit background, uh, credit checks. Um, and it previous evictions. So if you were living in an apartment that you couldn't afford and you got evicted or your landlord was a slumlord and you took him to court and you, you know, ended up losing and were evicted, those became an impediment to lottery apartments. And so the, the mayor has, uh, you know, re he's, he's made some changes to that so that credit is no longer a factor and that if you have been evicted, you know, there has to be uh, a, a more rigorous process for eliminating you. Um, but I think that it's a start. I think we can do more and we obviously need to build more if we're losing 400 units almost a year to destabilization. And speaking to that, Diana, it's true. We are losing 400 yeah. units uh, every year to destabilization. Um, and how would you address this issue, Robert? So I think when we talk about um, preservation and, and, and rent stabilization, uh, really making sure that we deal with um, legislation that so much of it happens on the state level and hoping that we can deal with uh, MCIs and capital improvements and uh, not allowing rents to come up after folks leave. So that, that ends up becoming an ongoing conversation that has to happen between the city and the state to make sure that we uh, retain our tenant protection laws and continue to enforce that. So that notwithstanding that conversation, making sure that we can keep people in their homes, making sure that those um, um, developments that are affordable stay affordable. That's why those developments that are our seniors, our Section 8202s are so important to keeping our seniors in their home, particularly because um, they, they make uh, the least and are the most vulnerable in our community. When we talk about our NYCHAs, making sure we get repairs and making sure that we can keep people in their homes and that they're um, uh, you know, able to stay there because we know that it is so hard um, to, to find the number of new developments necessary for so many people. And then with rent stabilization, we mentioned um, tenant harassment um, and, and, and enforcement as being the ways that we deal with keeping those units in rent stabilization. Tamika. 
Um, pretty much I will, oh, how am I going to deal with this? Sorry. If you would like, I can come back to you. Yeah, please do. Diana. Thank you. I mean, I, you know, I, I again, I, I agree with, with the assembly member in terms of what the state should be doing. Um, MCI increases, you know, create a significant, impose a significant uh, financial burden on families. And if your landlord is asking for an MCI increase because he invested $30,000, in fixing, you know, maybe the windows in the in the in the building, this MCI stays with you for the rest of your lifetime as that as a resident of that unit. I don't think that those laws are fair. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the buildings, a lot of the housing stock that we have, and again, we've done a lot around preservation. I am very strongly um, in favor of that. But because so, so much of the housing stock that we have is so old, um, and the rents have already exceeded, you know, the amounts that make them affordable, because we, we say rent stabilized, but rent stabilization for some people means $2,700 still, and that's not affordable. And so, unfortunately, we need to build some, you know, units, and we haven't really seen that a lot of that in the eighth district. Okay, so um, we need to really pass the Housing and Not Warehouse Act to making sure that people would be able to get into these housing because we have housing there. It's just being wearing housing and trying to figure out when is the next big buck is going to come so they can sell it and have it for market rate. So we just, when I get in the office, I would just be passing the Housing and Not Warehouse Act if it's not been passed by then. President Trump, as we all know, is looking at cuts within the HUD funding and many of the tax credits and rent burden programs that are coming currently to the state. Um, and there is even a discussion at the Congress level about um, removing the community preference associated with a lot of our tax credits today. How do you feel about this? And how would you, in the job of the council, would ensure that our people are protected if this should happen? I know it's a loaded yeah. question, yeah. and if you want to think about it for a few minutes, uh, but this is a serious issue yeah. because yeah. whatever happens in terms of the rezoning, any building that is built in New York City, 25 percent as we, or 30 percent yeah. is mandatory inclusionary housing. And generally, as you know, the community board has always advocated for 50 percent of those, pro those particular units to go to our residents. But if this law passes, then what, what do we have left? Yeah. So with that, I'm going to start with you, Robert. Community preference is one of the most important parts of this program. And I know we have significant headwinds when we talk about the federal government. And I think a lot about what we're thinking about, either on the state or the city level, is how do we go about doing this on our own? But there's no question that when we talk about this, you know, we have to continue to have our legislative leaders in, in the federal government represent us and fight to make sure that, that those tax credits and benefits don't go away. But I, I, I can't envision a future without community preference where we're building um, developments in our community that our residents may not even be eligible for. I mean, that, that take, there's already a, a disparity and, and some inequity in terms of um, the, the, the lottery process and, and, uh, and how many people are potentially able to qualify for that. If you take away the community preference, then we're, you know, we're literally, you know, have no, in, no insurance that any benefit of what happens in our community is actually going to go to the people who uh, invested in this community uh, to make it, make it what it is and make it as, as great as it is. So I think we have to continue to fight for that and look at other ways, if that goes away, that we can create um, equitable preference-based uh, systems. And, and if the federal government isn't giving the money, then they can't tell us what to do with that, by the way. So I think we would have to go on our own and make our own programs. Diana. I mean, community preferences, I, I understand what they're saying. They, they feel that, you know, uh, the community preference uh, excludes certain, you know, individuals from living in certain communities. Um, I get that. But they, it also offers individuals that live in my district an opportunity to, to stay in the in the communities that you know they were born and raised in and so i think that you know that it's important that we do everything that we can to preserve them and tamika well like i always do roll up my sleeve and fight like heck making sure i lobby the state lobby the um, congress and be in their faces at every given time making sure that i pass bills to actually protect us in case the federal just leave us down and always making sure that i got my hand on the pulse so when everything is going down i'm there with my colleagues to pass that bill to protect us so 
As you walk through East Harlem, there are a lot of empty storefronts, mm -hmm. and if they're not empty yet, they're in the process of closing. How would you protect the Ma and Pa's that we came to know so well in our community? And what would you do to help to stimulate more businesses and continue and hopefully grow them in East Harlem? And we'll start with you, Tamika. Okay, okay. perfect. Oh, as a small business owner myself, there's a lot of tax um, credits and tax laws that the small business owners do not know. Right, so my job as the city council is to go to each mom and pop stores and say, hey, there's a credit for you hiring employees. There's a credit if you want to redo your, your storefront. There's a credit if you want to do training and you know to upgrade and, this, and hire locally and have a collaboration with the um, Doe Foundation and have a collaboration with Youth Bill and have a collaboration with Urban Upbound so they can keep their pipeline to grow and have employees come in because Without the um, small business owners knowing all these types of credits is out there for them, that's how they're losing business, you know, and, and they're going to be closing down. Like my favorite, Kathy Flowers, she's closing down because she can't afford the rent. But if she knew that there was a grant out there for a small business woman owner, she'd be able to stay in her storefront. So my job as a city councilwoman is to make sure they know every tax credit, every opportunity it is to stay in the rent and actually pass a bill that will cap um, small business owners rent for going up day after day after day. Robert. So I think we have to look at uh, incentive programs that um, incentivize uh, property owners to uh, not go for the highest bidder at all times and, and, and also think about how do you, um, you know, make sure that if you have vacant storefronts, you know, for an extended amount of time that you know, you're not allowed to just warehouse that until you wait for you know, large-scale businesses like Dwayne Reed to come in and, 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 uh, and, and otherwise you'll leave your, your storefront vacant. So I think if we incentivize um, you know, the, uh, the property owner to uh, or incentivize and or penalize them for, for, for leaving it vacant for extended periods is, is a way that we can stimulate the conversation about um, getting small businesses um, back in because there are a number of tax credits that we've advocated for. There's the YouthWorks tax credit for small businesses um, to be able to hire in our community and uh, really the issue is around that property owner and whether or not they're going to uh, make a lease with a small business that they can afford and oftentimes you know the complaint is well our taxes are too high and therefore you know we have to get more rent from the from the businesses well then let's think about a tax credit program that incentivizes you to rent to that small mom and pop business and then uh, and also look at you know if if there are extended periods of vacant storefronts you know how are we helping you uh, as a as a city to be able to find a commercial tenant um, that that makes sense and how are we uh, helping to support that business so that it's successful once you do make that lease to them so they don't go out of business. Diana. Yeah, I agree. I think that um, being able to provide some sort of tax incentive to the landlords because the, the, the unfortunate reality is that a lot of these small businesses don't own the property uh, in which they, you know, coexist. And so offering some sort of tax credit to the landlords is an incentive to keep these small businesses open and at rents that they can afford um, is really important in terms of keeping these institutions alive. So now we're going to go to some lightning round questions. Yes. And they can either be yes or no, or one sentence within the 30 seconds or 10 seconds we're going to give you. Okay. And some of, let's start with the first question. Do you support congestion pricing? Realizing that we have the RFK Bridge, we have uh, the 138th Street Bridge, all coming through East Harlem, and obviously there will be significant uh, angst from people <laughs> who have to go across those bridges into the Bronx. Um, Diana, do you support it? I will give you the very quick answer. Sure. I'm not, it's not a yes, it's not a no. I'm open to any conversation that is beneficial to the constituents that I choose to, rep that I would like to represent. Thank you. Robert? Absolutely. I, I'm the lead sponsor of a Move New York bill that actually um, has a better solution than I think just congestion pricing that actually provides benefit for local residents and communities to make decisions about transportation in their district and makes the tolling fair for everybody across the city. And Tamika? Yes. Have you served on your community board? If yes, which one, Robert? I have a few gray hairs as a result of <laughs> serving on my community board, and I've chaired community board 11 for, for a number of years as well. So uh, I'm proud, a proud member of, of community board 11. Diana. I haven't served, but I spent a lot of, enough time there to feel like a member. Yes. Tamika. No, I keep on getting rejected when I apply. 
This is a loaded question. Do you support the mayor's proposal of a 2.5 percent ma mansion tax for property sales on homes priced at two million and above? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. What are we using it for? <laughs> <laughs> That's the question. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, you do. And the last thing is, how do you feel about charter schools? Again, yes or no, or just a very quick answer. I'm not opposed to charter schools. I'm a parent, and I, I, don't, I wouldn't want anyone to tell me where my children can or cannot go to school. I just have a problem with the co-location. I don't think that they're done uh, properly, and we, have, we then start to see issues of overcrowding and loss of space that could be used recreationally for music instruction, for other things. Yes, but more needs to be done on the co-location question yeah. and English language learners and special ed. Um, I believe that when you have a charter school, you should be able to either, when you co-locate, share the resources with the whole school and not just keep it to yourself or find your own space so you can have your own dollars. I think that should be self-funded and not taken away of our public school funds so our children can learn. Another question, rezoning or not? In recent years, many residents of East Harlem have expressed concerns about gentrification and the loss of our local culture. If elected, how are you planning to preserve El Barrio's cultural character? And let's start with you, Tamika. Well, first of all, I think when people move into our community, they should be able to adapt to, to the community that they live in. And if that doesn't work, making sure I have a town hall about diversity so everybody know how to co-mingle together. Having cultural fairs that's in the district, because I know when my mom grew up in East Harlem, she said it was like a, a community fair almost every Saturday where everybody in the neighborhood comes out together and play together. So I'm trying to bring that back into the community so everybody knows how to work well with each other. Robert. Cultural is a very important part of our community. Um, you know, it, it has uh, represented all different ethnicities and, and uh, of folks for, for generations, and I think that's what makes East Harlem a real melting pot. So being able to continue to preserve that in a couple of ways, one of the ideas and one of the reasons why I have issue with the rezoning is there should be inclusion of a cultural arts corridor and district uh, both either at 106th Street and at 125th Street to make sure that there is a sense of place included uh, in those main thoroughfares and corridors that really represent um, the community. In addition is making sure that our smaller arts organizations get some funding and I'm uh, happy that the, the, the city council and the mayor has started to address this issue and we've been fighting to get funding on the state level to make sure that smaller arts organizations that represent our culture actually get funding to continue to do the fairs and the and the uh, and the different activities that help reflect you know the the diversity of our community so I think it has to be a, a measure of funding and making sure that we draw a line in the sand that if you're gonna make changes in our community and redevelop that it reflects our community and our culture at the same time and Diana yeah I think that we have the benefit of living in a community that's very culturally uh, rich and I think that you know, we've started to do uh, to make some inroads in terms of preserving, uh, you know, parts of the, the the history and the culture in the East Harlem part of the district. Um, we've done, a, we've invested a lot of funding into La Marqueta, for instance. Uh, a lot of, you know, it was for many years it was underutilized, and so now we have, pro, you know, active programming there every, you know, weekend and in most days during the week, uh, preserving those festivals and those fairs that represent who we are as a fabric of the community. I think is vital. Um, and I think that we do that through the community board, right? We, we appoint people, individuals that are like-minded and that have the same sentiment and because we don't want to see, you know, what makes East Harlem special or what makes the South Bronx special disappear um, as new people are coming in. Thank you all for that. We've reached that point in the program where each of you will be given an opportunity for a closing statement. And I'd like to start with you, Diana. Well, I'm Diana Ayala. Again, I am a constituent of the 8th District as well. I was uh, actually lived in both parts of the district. I've lived in the South Bronx as well as the East Harlem part of the district now where I'm raising my family. My children go to PS57. They were born in Mount Sinai Hospital. I've spent 20 years of service in this community because um, you know, my personal life experiences have kind of led me to, you know, become more civically engaged. As I said, I have been a victim of domestic violence. I've been, you know, in shelter. I have been a single parent. I have been a teenage parent. And a lot of these experiences have allowed me uh, a unique ability to help other individuals in my uh, in my community. And I think that I've done that well. I think that the fact that I have so much community support uh, supports that fact, and I would love to be able to build on that work as your city council, as your next city council member. Thank 
you. Robert? I'm Assemblymember Rodriguez, someone who's born and raised in East Harlem, uh, been there for generations. My family comes out of Carver Houses and uh, had the good fortune of going to public schools in East Harlem, and I'm a product of what I think is a, a rich and diverse uh, experience and community that we have in East Harlem that we want to continue. I've had the good fortune to serve on the community board as a volunteer and to uh, begin those fights uh, for the last 15 years. Uh, to make sure that our community is represented in all levels, whether we're talking about affordable housing, creating job opportunities in our community, uh, and making sure that um, as a representative in the assembly for the last six years, we fight for equity, for those things that we deserve in our community, including making sure that we have access to transportation, the Second Avenue subway coming up north from 96th to 125th Street. Almost didn't happen if we didn't put that fight and make sure we got the, the money restored fighting for New York City public housing, because uh, we know how important it is. Um, so I've fought those thoughts, uh, I fought those battles in Albany, and I look forward to taking that experience and bringing it to bear in the city council so that we can put both of those uh, important parts of government together to come up with solutions, solutions that deal with the problems of our community now and over the next uh, four years. Thank you, and Tamika. Hi, I'm Tamika Mapp. Um, I want you to vote for me because you actually see yourself in my shoes, um, wanting to, to have change in the community, wanting somebody that's always going to be present, so wanting someone that's accessible and that you can reach out to no matter where, which way you reach out to. Someone that comes with bold, progressive ideas like moving the minimum wage to $20 per hour, making sure NYCHA is a, a hold accountable, making sure that we strengthen our youth services, making sure that we pass the right to no law so our kids can stop being harassed in the streets by the police officers. And if you answer all that, that question is Tamika Mapp, then you vote for me. I'm number two on the ballot. You can reach me on Facebook at East Harlem Committee for Good Government. I will talk to you back there. There's resources on there already for you to know what's going on in your community. So I'm number two on the ballot, and I'm Tamika Mapp. So I want to thank you all and all of the candidates for participating in today's debate. The primary elections will be held on Tuesday, September 12th. For more information about voting, locating your poll site, and the candidates, you can visit the League of Women Voters website lwvnyc.org or mnn.org and click on race to represent. Please remember, only voters enrolled in a political party having a primary may vote in a primary election. Thank you for watching Race to Represent on Manhattan Neighborhood Network and goodbye.